This morning, if you will, take your Bibles and open them to Acts 21. Acts 21 is where we'll be. As you're turning there and as you prepare for us to look at this, this passage, I want to share with you uh, just a segment of a book. In 1996, there was a book that came out called Conversations with God. It became a bestseller. It sold a ton of copies, 2.5 million copies it sold, Conversations with God. The author was Neil Donald Walsh, and he says that one day he simply started writing down his direct conversations with God. Now, the God he speaks of is not the one true God of Scripture. This is some figment of his imagination. It's not... Uh, connected with any other religion. He just presents a God who satisfies uh, the spiritual yearnings of the culture. But it's not the God that we read of in Scripture. And so here's one of the conversations that he had in this book, and I think it's very typical of the culture that we live in. He's, God says this, I cannot tell you my truth until you stop telling me yours. Walsh replies, but my truth about God comes from you. Who said so, God said? Others. What others? Walsh said, leaders, ministers, rabbis, priests, books, the Bible for heaven's sake. God says, those are not authoritative sources. Walsh says, they aren't? No. Then what is? And here's God's reply. Listen to your feelings. Listen to your highest thoughts. Listen to your experience. Whenever any one of these differ from what you've been told by your teachers or read in your books, forget those words. Feelings, emotions in our culture have been elevated above all other things. Feelings have been elevated above truth. Now, feelings are powerful, sometimes too powerful, many times overwhelming, many times paralyzing. But should they be elevated over truth? Should our feelings really dictate everything we do? Should that be what drives us and guides us as, as we walk the path of life? Our feelings or our emotions? Well, probably two of the most powerful feelings or emotions that we have, we're going to see in this passage today. I think two of the most powerful we have are hate and fear. Hate and fear. And so let's look at Acts 21. We're really going to deal with verses 7 through 14. The last time we saw the Apostle Paul, he, you remember he met the Ephesian elders and he encouraged them to be good shepherds of God's people. And then as he was departing, they knelt together, they prayed, and with tears they embraced one another and said goodbye because they knew that was the last time they would see the Apostle Paul. Now the first six verses in chapter 21, Dr. Luke, the author of Acts, records Paul's travel. Again, he encounters followers of Christ. Again, he is warned of going to Jerusalem. Again, he knelt and prayed with his brothers and sisters in Christ and told them goodbye. Paul again entered a ship. He began a new voyage, which led him to Ptolemais, where he, was, uh, he saw some fellow believers, and then he went, to, he went to a great place. He went to Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima. It could be called just Caesarea by the sea. And this was a beautiful place. This, this was a place, it was on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It had, they, King Herod had come there. He had built a magnificent harbor. You can still, still go there today and see all this. Uh, Herod had a palace there. He named the city Caesarea at, in honor of Caesar. On, at his palace there, just on the edge of the sea, he had an Olympic-sized pool. As you, as you walk along in Caesarea, they had a big, huge amphitheater that will come into play later in the Scripture. And then 
They have a hippodrome there where they had horse races. And they had these incredible aqueducts that brought water from miles. And, and they were engineered just right that that water would just stream down there and bring cool, refreshing water, clean water to the city. It's a magnificent place. If you ever get to go to Israel, you go to Caesarea, and it'll be one of your favorite stops because it's just a beautiful place there on the edge of the Mediterranean. Caesarea is where we'll focus today, and this is where we'll learn this truth. The gospel overcomes feelings. The gospel overcomes feelings. So let's stand in honor of the Lord and His Word. We're going to look at Acts 21, 7 through 14. When we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and we came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. That's kind of a tough word to say sometimes. Prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt. When we heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him, Paul, not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm already... For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The gospel overcomes feelings. I just want, last week I had six points for you. The judge asked me first thing this morning, How many points you got this week? Two points, two points this week, all right? I'm not sure that means shorter, but only two points. All right, the gospel overcomes feelings. The first thing I want you to see is that gospel is greater than hate. The gospel is greater than hate. Turn your attention to verse 8. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. This is an interesting verse. Paul arrives at Caesarea this beautiful city, and the scripture tells us that he stayed, with, stayed there. As it tells us he stayed there, it introduces us to his host. And that host we are introduced to way back in Acts 6. In Acts 6, there, you remember there arose a complaint from the uh, Greek-speaking Jewish converts against the native Israelite converts because the Greek widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so the apostles who had been called to preach the word of God said it's not fitting that we would serve tables. We have to be in prayer and we must be preaching the word. And so what did they do? They selected seven men from among themselves, men of good reputation, men full of the spirit and of wisdom, and they put them in charge of this service. This was the first, you remember this, these were the first deacons. They served these widows. Philip was the second man in the list. Stephen was first, then Philip in that list of these chosen deacons. He was called Philip the Evangelist. Why is he called Philip the Evangelist? Because he was an evangelist. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we meet Philip again in verse 8, and that is precisely what he was doing. In verse 4 of chapter 8, Philip is preaching the gospel in Samaria, and God was using him and working through him in powerful ways. But then the Lord called Philip away to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there, you remember, Philip met the youth Ethiopian eunuch, and he shared the gospel with him. And this Ethiopian said, there's water. What prohibits me from being baptized? He says, nothing. And he baptized him, and then what happens? Philip snatched away, and he's gone. And he goes to Azotaz, and there he preaches his way to Caesarea, and evidently he settled down in Caesarea, and there in Caesarea he preached the gospel. He was an evangelist in that great, great city. Now if you look back 
in Acts. I just told you about chapters 6 and 8. If you look back to the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of 8, we're also introduced to another character. We're introduced to Saul, who would become, as you know, Paul. But then, remember, Paul watched at the end of chapter 7. He watched as Stephen was stoned. He watched as they took his life for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the scripture tells us that he watched and he approved of them stoning Stephen. And then as we move on in chapter 8, the scripture tells us that that Saul was rounding up the church that he was going about and he sought to destroy the church. And he went out and he went from house to house, the scripture says, and he would drag out people. And it, it, was, it was called a great persecution that began against the church. And Paul was the man, or Saul at that time, who was doing this, dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. At that time, Saul, Paul, hated the church. He hated Christians. He wanted nothing to do with them. He wanted to rid the earth of them. He wanted to destroy them. But now, look back at chapter 21, verse 8. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. So in this house, we have the former hater of all that is Christianity, and we have one of the leading figures in Christianity, Philip the evangelist. I mean, do you understand what's going on here? This is like, if you like Westerns and you like Josie Wales, this is like Josie Wales and Captain Redlegs living in the same house. This is like Doc Holliday and Johnny Ringo living in the same house. This is like Custer and was it Sitting Bull living in the same house. How does this happen? How can these two who were so different and one who hated the other so much, how can they come together and how could Philip the Evangelist welcome him into his home? I only know of one way it happens. It only happens by way of the gospel. It only happens by way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember Paul, though he had once breathed murderous threats against the church, was confronted by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and he, he was knocked down and, from, and confronted with the gospel. And from that day forward, Paul, Saul, became a believer in Jesus Christ, and instead of uh, persecuting the church, persecuting Christians, he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ recklessly and without abandon. Everywhere he went, he talked about Jesus, where Paul once hated the church and wanted to destroy every member of the church, after trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he promoted the church, promoted the Lord Jesus, and loved the church. You know, this happens when you experience the gospel in your life and when you walk in the gospel. It changes your heart, it changes your mind, it changes your thinking. I remember when I was in college, I was in a biology class, which I hated, really. But there was a kid in there that I didn't like much more than I liked the class. His name was Jody Weiser. He was a, mm, I don't know how to, Uncle Tim would call him a punk. And that's, that's kind of the way I thought of him. He wore shorts every day and something wore a cap every day, and he was always making smart remarks. And I just could not stand this kid. I mean, really. I had some hate in my heart for him. I didn't like him. I didn't want to be around him. I really didn't want him to, I didn't want him to come to class. I just didn't like him. But you know, something happened. I, you know, I was trying to walk with the Lord, and we went. I went on a retreat with the um, BSU, 
And on this retreat, guess who shows up in his shorts and cap that he wore every day? <laughs> Jody Weiser. And after the preaching that night, I think there was a bonfire or something. And guess who's staying in my cabin, sleeping in the bunks right close to me? Jody Weiser. And we began to talk and we began to share with one another about what the Lord had done in our lives, where we came from, how the Lord had changed us and, and our, our, really our, our heart to serve Him and to walk with Him. And you know, Jody Weiser became one of my very best friends at college. He turned out to be a magnificent man of God. He and I started a ministry there on, on campus together that really grew and God blessed and, and God used to just have fellowship with, with other believers. And he just became one of my very favorites. And still to this day, he's one of my very favorites. And you know what? When I think about him now in those shorts and that cap and his funny answers, they're not smart aleck answers anymore. They were funny. He became one of my favorite people. Hate is a powerful emotion. Hate doesn't allow its slave to see anything good in its object. Only the bad. Hate rejects the idea. Listen to this. Hate rejects the idea of forgiveness. Sees its object of unworthy of liking or love or forgiveness. Hate builds a wall that isolates the heart. Isolates the individual from others. But we serve a God who is described as love. 2 Corinthians 13 speaks of the God of love. God displays the greatness of his love, as I've said already earlier, sending his son Jesus to die so that the world might be forgiven of sin. Jesus calls his followers to forgive as they've been forgiven. That's love. Jesus told his disciples the world would know that they are his followers, what? By their love for one another. 1 John 4, 7, 8 says this. 7 and 8 says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you, and so the love of God resides in you. And so as you've experienced the gospel, and as you walk in the gospel day in and day out, knowing of your forgiveness of sin, and knowing the love of God in your life, guess what? You love other people, and hate is rooted out. Hate is extinguished. And all of a sudden, if you walk in this gospel and you live in this gospel, you're able to forgive. You're able to offer love to those that you once thought didn't deserve your love. When someone messes up and hurts you really bad, somehow, somehow from deep within, by way of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're able to forgive them and love them in spite of the hurt that they've caused you. The gospel is greater than hate. Listen, there may be somebody in your life that you despise. I've used the word hate a lot today, and I know what all of you are thinking out there. Oh, I don't hate anybody. I know the Bible tells us not to hate anybody. But you know, I wouldn't have said I hated Jody Weiser. I just never wanted to see him again. Isn't that hate? I mean, if there's somebody in your life that you just don't ever want to see again, you really don't ever care to hear talk again, you just soon put them out of your life, isn't that hate? I mean, what could be worse? So let me, let me just say, if there's somebody in your life that you despise, that you really want out of your life, that you want nothing to do with, that you don't want to talk to, you, you go the other way. 
Show them the love of Christ. Show them the same love that was given to you. Show them the same forgiveness that was given to you. And allow the Lord, by way of the gospel, to push that hate out of your heart. And I promise you that you'll feel much better when you allow the Lord to eradicate that hate in your life and you embrace them, you forgive them. And it's not always easy. It's not always fun. But it's always right. It's always right. The gospel is greater than hate. So I pray if there's a problem in your life that you allow the gospel to push that out. Well, the second one, I told you one of the greatest fears, I believe, is <laughs> one of the greatest emotions, the strongest emotions, is fear. But the, here's, here's the great truth. The gospel is greater than fear, okay? The gospel is greater than fear. Fear is as powerful as hate. Fear paralyzes its victims. Fear can absolutely dominate a person or a society. We've seen that. But the follower of Christ does not have to live in fear. And listen, as we're talking about this, I want, I want you to understand there's a difference in wisdom, being wise, and being reckless, and being fearful. And we'll, we'll think about that a little bit. Let's, so let's re- return to the passage and see what I'm talking about. The Scripture gives us a few more details as who's staying in the house. The Scripture says that Philip had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Now, we have no idea what they prophesied or what their ministry of prophecy was. It could be that they told, uh, shared with Dr. Luke the stories that he wrote down about Philip the evangelist that we talked about earlier. I don't know what they shared with him. But anyway, they were prophetesses. So in verse 10, it says, As we're staying there some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And so this this prophet came down from Jerusalem and, and coming to us, it says he took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns the belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And at this, the other Christians around began begging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. That's a pretty heavy word, isn't it? I mean, you, you roll into Caesarea, it's a beautiful city, you're looking at all the great scenery, you're enjoying Philip the Evangelist, you're enjoying his daughters, having a good time, and then all of a sudden, Agabus shows up, Debbie Downer shows up and says, listen, you're fixing to go to Jerusalem, you're going to be tied up, you're going to be handed over to the Gentiles, probably to the Roman authorities. But this was nothing new to Paul. Paul had already received these warnings. And so we may wonder, was God trying to tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem? Well, I don't think so. Paul is faithful, and we've seen that the Holy Spirit instructed him to stay away from particular areas. When, he, when the Holy Spirit instructed him, he didn't go to those places. But possibly the prophecies were used to prepare him for what was coming, to tell him what he was about to face. At any rate... The believers around him didn't want him to go, and even, we'll see in a few moments, Dr. Luke uh, evidently echoed their voices. But I want you to take note of the courage of Paul. In verse 13, Paul responded to those around him begging him not to go after he received this warning. Listen, look at what he says. He says, what are you doing? He said, "You're, you're crying, you're breaking my heart. But listen, I'm not... I'm ready not only to be bound at Jerusalem, but I'm even ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, what what great faith, what courage. Let me ask you something. Is that the way you would respond? If a prophet came to you and said, listen, you're fixing to go over to Delhi, but listen, you're going to be bound up over there and they're going to hand you over to the authorities and you're going to be, who knows what's going to happen. What would you do? Paul had great courage because of the gospel. 
Why do I say the gospel is greater than fear? Because when one knows Christ, his or her eternity is sure. When we understand who it is we serve, we understand that he holds all things in his hand and he is in control of all things. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said to his followers, listen close, we all need to get this. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. No doubt Paul knew those words. Paul knew who held his future. Paul knew who sustained his life. Reminds me of the great military uh, General Stonewall Jackson. He was warned by one of his captains of the danger of riding in the front lines. He would ride back and forth and he would call them on to fight, encourage them to stay in the fight, encourage them on how to do things. And this captain said, you need to get back or you're going to get killed. And listen to what he said. This is a direct quote from Stonewall Jackson. Captain, my religious belief or my faith teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to always be ready no matter when it may overtake me. That is the way all men should live, and then all would be equally brave. My mercy if we could live that way. I pray that I'll press on with little fear of the men or of this world. I pray I'll not be fearful of death. I'll not be fearful of dying or being killed, but will simply obey God however and whatever he, he calls me to. I pray that I'll not be fearful of man's thoughts or man's words as God calls me to serve, but I'll only be concerned with what God thinks of me and how he looks at what I'm doing. And if I live in the gospel, if I know the gospel and the gospel has changed my life and I understand my salvation rests in him, I can have great resolve and peace and fear will be minimal. And when it comes, I can say like the psalmist says, when I am afraid, I will simply trust in the Lord and press on. You can have faith and confidence in God. You can cast your fear aside through the gospel you can say with with stonewall jackson i feel as safe anywhere as i do in bed because he has my days in his hand now you want to be wise i'm not saying that you live recklessly you know if you go to disney world don't ride the tower of terror you may die on it <laughs> right uncle tim did you survive it? A wise man right there, see? I'm just kidding about that. But there are things certainly you don't want to do. But we can all say this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. The gospel overcomes our feelings. If you have the book, Conversations with God, I suggest you take it out and you throw it in the garbage. <laughs> Don't listen to your feelings, your highest thoughts. Don't listen to your experience necessarily when it's compared to truth. And whenever one of your higher thoughts or your feelings or your experience differs from what's in the Word of God, you go with the Word of God. And you trust the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is greater than your feelings. The gospel is greater than hate. The gospel is greater than fear. And the truth is gospel, the gospel is greater than any of your emotions. And so we will walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you.